All right. Um, look at 2 Timothy 2.15, just for a minute. 2 Timothy 2.15. And we're going to, uh, God willing, we're going to finish what we started a few weeks ago. And um, we've been talking about how to study your Bible. Um, you know, somebody said a um, long time ago that ignorance is a way to control the people. You know, if you can keep people ignorant, you can control them. And if you can keep people ignorant of the Bible, you can control them religiously. And uh, the Lord doesn't intend that any of us be ignorant of the Bible. Look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And you know, we've given you several things. Um, the first thing we said, if I can find it. The first thing is read, read, read. You know, the way you get to know any book is read it. And then if you read it again, you keep reading it. You just you learn it a little better, a little better, a little better. Uh, we said mark places. Uh, notice places in your Bible as you read that are similar. And, um, and make a little note in your margin in each place and just uh, mark those places. Um, we talked about the law of first mention. Notice the first time a word shows up in Scripture. And often it will give you a real indication of how God views that thing, really, from one end of the Bible to the other. Uh, we talked about context. You know, notice the verses and chapters surrounding the verse you're looking at. If you're having trouble and you think, what is this talking about? Well, if you will look at the context, you know, and, and that's just even, even a rule in, in regular study, regular reading. Um, ask the Lord questions. Um, we said, always assume that the Bible is right. Um, use a dictionary. And um, so we're going to pick up there tonight. And, um, you know, um, in, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to give you another place to turn. But in James chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Draw nigh to God. Nigh means near. Draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. And the thought is, thought is this. If, if you'll take a step towards God, you know what He does? He takes a step towards you. Draw nigh to God and he'll, he'll draw near to you. Draw nigh to you. Um, so with that thought in mind, you know, it just makes sense that as you read your Bible, that really should be your goal. Is It's not just something academic. You know, it's not just, you know, I, I want to get good at this so I can impress people or so I can, you know, you know I, I can fit in with somebody. No, 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 no. The, this whole thing is about the Lord. This is His Word. And man, there's something about His Spirit that impregnates this book. And, uh, and when, you, when you read it, when, if, if we read it rightly, you know, we're, we're saying, we open it and we say, Lord, speak to me. You know, show me what you want me to see. And so you're trying to draw near to God, right? So with that thought in mind, look at 1 Peter 5. And I'm going to give you the, the thought here. We've got a few, few points tonight. We're talking about how to study your Bible. 1 Peter 5, verse 5. 1 Peter 5, verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud. You know, we're trying to draw near to God, right? But there's some people that God will not let near him. And I mean, in, in church, they can't get near him. And I mean, you know, they might, they might think they're getting near him, but they can't get near him. Why is it? For God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Man, he'll bend over backwards to meet the humble. But man, when somebody's proud in their heart, God does this. God says, no. You can't get near. Um, look at Proverbs, the book of Proverbs for the next few verses. And, and the point that I'm getting across here with studying your Bible, here's the point, that humility is a must. Humility is a must. 
For some people, that's not a problem. For some of you, that is not, a, you, you don't have an ounce of trouble with this, you know. But there are people that, um, you know, they're too proud to be taught. They're, they're just, um, they're going to challenge everything they hear. And, um, and not, because they're, not because they're looking for information or, or, or not because they're an honest doubter. But it's just, um, you know, they're just, they're just going to develop their own spin on it. And they don't want to hear what anybody else has to say. And so that's how they read their Bible. And you know what? You'll never be able to really study the Bible that way. I mean, you can study it, but you're not, you're not going to get what God wants you to get. You're not going to get that. Um, look at uh, Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. The Bible has a lot to say about this subject. I just want you to see a few verses. Proverbs 16, verse 5. Proverbs 16, verse 5. Every one... Every one that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Look at Proverbs 13. And sometimes it's not a matter of, you know, you can't tell them anything, but sometimes people, people do things and they're, they're doing it because they're conscious of their image. Oh, I, I, I want to... I'm going to study the Bible so I can, I can be one of those guys that looks like they know something. God says no. No. Look at Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13, verse 10. Only by pride cometh contention. You know, you get people that, that, that are arguing and fussing and fighting. And uh, boy, one of them, maybe both, but one of them has a pride problem. Only by pride cometh contention. Look at Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8. It says, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Now this is interesting. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. You guys know this. We live in, we, we live in a very sensitive age. I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's more than ever. Um, and, and I am certainly, you know, the Bible says we're to be kind one to another. We're, we, nobody should be out to consciously offend or be brassy on purpose. You know, we, we, I, I trust you understand that. But, but, you know what? There's even times when, when, you know, a wise man, there's something about being rebuked. There's something about being corrected that it actually reveals something about a person. Um, reprove not a scorner. You know how a scorner's going to react? They're going to hate you because you called their number. You called it out. You know what? They're going to hate you. But God says a wise man doesn't respond like that. You know wise people need rebuke too? They do. But God says you can always tell a wise man. You rebuke him and he still loves you. Look at verse 10. Give instruction to a wise man and he will find it hard to swallow. That's what it says. He will be yet wiser. You know, he's just, he's just looking to learn. He's looking to learn. Look at Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8, verse 13. Proverbs 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. That's the Lord talking. He says, pride and arrogancy. He said, I hate it. Um, so let me give you an example. Look, go to Jeremiah chapter 1. You're in Proverbs. If you go to the right, you'll see, uh, you know, several books. You'll see Isaiah, and then you'll see Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah chapter 1. You know, we talked Sunday night about Apollos. And we said one of the things about Apollos was, though he was already eloquent, he was gifted, he was already mighty in the scriptures. But you know, the thing, the thing that made Apollos what he was, was, man, he was humble. He was like, he wanted, he wanted to know more. He was teachable. Look at um, Jeremiah 1. Humility is a must. Jeremiah 1, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, Jeremiah is talking, saying, 
Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah responds to God. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. You know what you see there? Jeremiah was a great prophet. And God comes along and calls him. And, um, and you know, one of the things you see was he was, man, he was humble. He was humble. And it wasn't fake. You know, you, know, you can always spot, I think most of the time, you can speak fake humility. And, um, um, and certainly the Lord can. And the Lord would never have recorded this if Jeremiah was pretending. But Jeremiah wasn't pretending. He said, Lord, you got the wrong guy. He said, I'm a nobody. I don't know anything. He said, God, I'm like a little child. And God says, oh, no. He says, you're the one I want. So humility is a must. Okay. So let me give you another one. Let me give you another one. Um, read all of the Bible. I know we started off with read, read, read. Okay. But, but let me say this. Read. If you, if you want to get to know your Bible, if you want to study your Bible, read all of the Bible. You need to read with some system or program that works for you. You know, every New Year's, and I mean, I've still got a bunch back there if somebody wants one. Every New Year's, we print off uh, at least three different Bible readings or four. Man, you can go online. You can find a bunch more. And, um, and there, there's all sorts of plans out there that, you know, in a year's time or actually as many times as you want, you can read your Bible through, and you read it all. Somebody came to me, uh, and I know I've mentioned this, but somebody came to me a while back, and um, we, they were talking about, uh, we were talking about some people that believe some really wacko stuff in, in our ranks, okay? And, um, and they said this, Pastor, do they even read the Bible? And then they said, you know, I mean, all of it? And the implication is this, and this is true. They couldn't believe the crazy stuff they believe if they read all of it. Yeah. A.W. Tozer said this many years ago. He said, a whole Christian needs a whole Bible. Let me give you another one. All right. Another thing to, as you read your Bible, to study your Bible is never fail to notice the obvious. Now you say, Pastor, this is so simple. Yeah, I know. Um, but it's amazing how some folks can read a passage in the Bible and they can absolutely, totally miss the obvious. You know, some people, they're, they're looking for something deep and mysterious. And man, the Bible's full of deep stuff. It really is. But, you know, um, some people, they're, they're always fishing for, you know, the deep stuff, but they miss the obvious. And you know what's most important? Is the obvious. Because God wanted the obvious to be obvious. Because he, he wanted you to see it. Let me give you another one, okay? One thing you'll notice in your Bible is, okay, here we go, there, double fulfillments, or partial fulfillments. And I'm going to give you an example, okay? Uh, you, you know, one-third of your Bible is prophecy. One-third. Literally, if, you, if, you could, if, you could, um, if your Bible was arranged this way, about almost one out of every three verses is prophetic. Um, and so, but as you read along, you'll notice some things where something is partially fulfilled, but then later it's completely fulfilled, or sometimes God immediately totally fulfills it, and yet He's going to do that same thing again. And so I want to, I want to show you an example. Go to Joel chapter 2. You're in Jeremiah probably, and um, you'll go to the right. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Joel's a little book. Now, as I tell you this, and I'm going to show you this, and it's really neat, okay? But I'm not showing it to you just, just because it's neat. But it really is. And, and you'll find, as you read, you'll notice this in several places where this kind of thing happens. But I was talking to uh, somebody uh, several months ago, and, um, 
They, they got really, um, they, they were arguing with me, uh, you know, and I wasn't trying to argue, but, but they, were, they were trying to, um, you know, they didn't agree with the way we view something, and, and so they were really, really telling me why they didn't. And so, so they pulled this verse out, and so I said, okay. I said, let's look at that verse. So we, we looked at it, and we looked at the passage, and, um, and he said, see there, it's, it's been fulfilled. And um, you would have, have to have heard the whole conversation, but he was dramatically pulling that whole thing out of its context, and he wasn't allowing for the fact that there was, sure, that verse had partially been fulfilled, but there was still a big chunk of that passage that was yet to be fulfilled. And, and it, was, it was very obvious. It was very obvious. And, I kept, and he couldn't see the obvious. And the reason he couldn't see the obvious was he had an agenda as he approached the Scripture. The Scripture had to, uh, had to agree with what this thing he wanted to promote. But the Scripture really didn't support his view. So I just want you to see a place. Look at Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and the terrible day of the Lord. So I got a question and a lot of you will know the answer. That's why I'm asking it. It's just not a trick question. Okay. Verse 30 and 31, wonders in heaven and earth, blood, fire, the sun turned into darkness. When is that going to occur? Uh, you guys know the answer. Many of you do say it. Don't be afraid. Yes, in the tribulation period. Uh, man, you know, that, you know, just a little ways down the road here, I don't know if it's a year, I don't know if it's six months, maybe, maybe it's six hours away, I don't know. The Lord's going to sound that trumpet and we're out of here. And then... There, 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 the world will step into a period of seven years. Um, the last three and a half years, it will be hell will break loose on this earth and God will pour out uh, the judgments of the book of Revelation and it's going to be literal. And the Bible says, unless those days should be shortened, no flesh would be saved. I mean, God is going to literally pour out his wrath. He's held it back and he's held it back and he's been patient. He's been long suffering, but boy, oh boy, it's just about to the brim. And, and you know what? When that happens, he is literally going to judge this world. Now, you guys know that, all right? So, um, but notice what he says in these verses, verse 28. You know, he says, um, in the same context, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And um, verse 29, I'll pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders, right? So it seems all to be connected. So go to Acts chapter 2. Now some of you know where we're going here. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now you know what happens in Acts chapter 2? The Lord Jesus had uh, went back to heaven and uh, he told the disciples to, to tarry in Jerusalem until the promise of the Spirit would be poured out. The Lord Jesus said to them while they lived, he said, you know, the day is coming, I'm going to go away. And he says, if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But he said, but I'm going to go away and I'm going to give you my spirit. And he says, but you, you'll have to wait after I leave just for a little while. Well, Jesus ascends up into heaven and seven days later, it's, it's the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was a feast of the Jews. And it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And man, the Holy Ghost suddenly came into that room where they had been praying without ceasing for seven days. And, and you see it there, um, verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. That had never occurred before. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues 
as the Spirit gave them utterance. And you know from the passage you keep reading down, those other tongues were not heavenly gibberish. They were languages. Um, verse 7. And they, all the Jews that were present, they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? You find in another place that the Pharisees knew something about these guys. I'm not sure how they deduced this, you know, but, but, you know, several of the guys the Lord called were fishermen before they were His disciples. And the Pharisees knew these were uneducated men. They were not linguists. And you see it here, verse 7. Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia. Verse 11, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying, wondering, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But that was ridiculous. So, you, know, you know, you can drink all the wine you want and you're not going to speak in four different languages. You know, you, you may resort to gibberish. Okay. But uh, verse 14, but Peter standing up with the 11. Now watch what Peter says. Standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. It was nine o'clock in the morning. Wrong hour to be drunk. Verse 6, 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He is preaching to Jews, and a lot of them were Jewish proselytes, but they were from every nation under heaven. And, you know, these guys knew their Old Testament. That is the, the pride of, of, and especially back in that day, the Jews knew the Old Testament. And so what does Peter do? He immediately tells them, this is what you guys know is in the book of Joel. And what he does, he starts quoting Joel chapter 2, which we just read. Here it is, verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now, you know what he does? He quotes the rest of the passage. Verse 19, and I shall show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. You know what did not happen on the day of Pentecost? None of that happened. There were not signs in heaven above. There was not pillars of fire and smoke and the sun didn't turn into darkness and the moon didn't turn into blood. You know what you have in Acts chapter 2? Peter said, this is what Joel prophesied. And by the way, the last days started right, right about then, okay? And you see that in the book of Hebrews, but I'm getting off topic. Um, but let me just say this. You know what you see in Acts chapter 2? You see a partial fulfillment. In Acts chapter 2, part of it came to pass. The rest is coming to pass shortly. For us. Okay? So you see a partial fulfillment. And as you read, especially when you read prophecy, you will see that. And there will be places where you will see something else. You'll see some huge time frames, sometimes in the same verse or sometimes in two verses. Let me show you that. Look at Isaiah chapter 9. You got the book of Psalms in the middle of your Bible. You have Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. Look at Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Now, you guys, uh, you, you know, you, we quote these verses often at Christmas time. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. 
and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Okay, so that's a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Okay, so, so look at verse 6 again. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Okay, you, you can see that. That's, that's, that's Bethlehem. Okay, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But the next phrase says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. So help me out. An honest, easy question, not a trick question. When is that going to happen? Yes. At the end of the tribulation, Jesus Christ comes back to the earth at the battle of Armageddon, and he will save Israel from that final battle, and a nation will be born in a day. And man, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to set up an earthly kingdom in Jerusalem for a thousand years and, um, and he will literally sit upon the throne of his father, David. So here's what I'm getting at. Look at the verse again. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And you see that colon there? That's 2,000 years. There's 2,000 years between the word given and the next phrase. But it's all true. It's all the same person. It's the Lord Jesus, and it's going to happen. Okay, but, you know, Isaiah is a prophet, and he's speaking prophetically. And you know what, by the way, this is why the Jews in, in our Lord's day, uh, you know, uh, they, 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 all their life, I mean, all through that Old Testament, they knew that a deliverer was coming. They knew that a king was coming. They knew that one day Jerusalem would be restored and, uh, and they had all these prophecies about the Messiah. And that's why when the disciples walked with the Lord and he said, they're going to kill me. And they're like, no. They said, you're, you're the one. We believe you're the one. He said, I am the one. He said, but they're going to kill me. And they're like, no, this can't be. Um, and that's why as the Lord, you know, he raises from the dead. And just before he ascends, he says, wilt thou at this, um, they say to him, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Why, why, why were they, why were they, because of verses like this, they knew that the Son of God would come and that the government, their scripture said it, but they didn't understand there would be a gap between his birth and him being the king. Um, okay, let me give you the last thought tonight. I'll, I'll make a couple comments, but first, first Corinthians chapter 10. So, so you'll notice as you read, as you study your Bible, you'll notice double fulfillments or partial fulfillments. And you'll notice, especially when you read in the prophets, you'll notice some, sometimes even in the same verse, there will be a huge time frame. But this is one of the most important things, what, what, we're gonna, what I'm going to show you now. 1 Corinthians 10. So as you study your Bible, you want to look for something, okay? So let's begin at verse 1, 1 Corinthians 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. He's talking about the crossing of the Red Sea. And we're all baptized into Moses in the cloud in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted neither be ye idolaters as were some of them as it is written 
And, and you know where he's, he's going to quote? He's going to quote from Exodus 32 right here. It is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. He's referring to Numbers chapter 25. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. He's referring to Numbers chapter 21. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. He's referring to Numbers chapter 14. Now, all these things happened unto them for in samples, that's a living example, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Twice in that passage, he says, these things are our examples. Okay, look at Romans chapter 15. Just go back to the left and just a few pages and you'll hit the end of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 15. Romans 15 verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of scriptures. You know, you read and you look at all the things that they went through and the things they experienced, the things they did, the mistakes they made, the good things they did. God says, you know what it'll do for you? It'll give you some patience and it will comfort you. Through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. It will give you some hope. So here's, here's my thought. The last thought is, as you study, look for examples one guy said this, and the Bible's full of it. The Old Testament, and the New Testament too, but the Old Testament's full of it. Um, he said, you know, there's almost nothing you're going to experience in life. Now, I know we've got computers, and they didn't have computers and all that stuff. But, you know, the temptations, the way we're wired, the, the, the stresses of life, all that stuff, um, you know, the Lord speaks to you, and you've got to make a decision. You know, none of that has ever changed. And, um, you know, as you read that, you'll see people, they, they, they decided to do this. Some people decided to listen to God, and man, it, it, it turned out really good. Some people decided to half listen to God, and that didn't turn out so good. Some people decided to rebel against God, and boy, that didn't turn out good. And, uh, and you know, some people got tricked, and some people forgot to seek the Lord. And some people were pressured by a family member. Oh, my word, it's all the stuff that you and me go through. It's all right there. They, they give Einstein the credit for this, but it's questionable. Einstein says insanity is doing the same thing that's always been done and expecting a different result. You want to know how it's going to turn out? It's right there. You say, well, well, I'm going to do this. You know what? Honest to God. Anybody that knows that book, they can look you right in your God-given eyeballs and they can tell you where you're headed. Well, I'm going to do this. Well, if it's the right thing, it's going to be okay. If you're playing with something, if you're, you're going to do this, and you're going to think, well, you know, it'll, it'll be different for me. Afraid not. And that's why you need to read. And that's why you need that's something you need to look for. And let me give you a couple real quick examples and we'll be done. Um, look at uh, 1 Kings 12, just real quick. Uh, there's, there's, oh man, there's probably hundreds we could look at. But we'll just real quick, we'll only look at 95. <laughs> 1 Kings 12. You guys know this story? Man, there's some places in the Bible that, in, in, you know, they're, they're tough sledding. And then there's other places that, you know, they're just full of uh, amazing stories. And, and when we say stories, they're, they're true. Every detail is true. 1 Kings 12, verse 1. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father, and that's Solomon, 
Thy father made our yoke grievous. In other words, Solomon, even though he was wise, Solomon, you know, really, he really got away from the Lord as his life progressed. And um, he became a very oppressive ruler. Um, the taxation, all that stuff, he really, it got out of hand. And you know what? The people suffered under that. He was king for 40 years. Verse 4, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore, make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. And he, Rehoboam, said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people, who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, my little, father, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. In other words, you ain't seen nothing yet. And now, whereas my father did lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, and I will chastise you with scorpions. And you see a few things there. And you know what? The Bible says these things were written for our examples. And there's just several things you see as reading. And you know what? He, uh, he did what those young men said, and he split the kingdom, and the kingdom was never reunited. And uh, he lost 10 tribes of Israel that went their own direction. He only retained two. And you see a few things. One of the examples you see is um, um, you, um, you can get the, uh, in your, you see this young man, old man thing here. You young people, as you read this, the, boy, the, what a lesson. You know, you, the advice of your peers is probably not going to be the best. Now, if they're godly and they la love the Lord, that's okay. Um, but again, you see this young man, old man thing. Um, you know what the Bible says? It's, it's some, the Bible's an amazing book if you read it. It says, um, um, thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. Um, the hoary head means silver-headed, gray-haired. It says, the glory of young men is their strength, but the glory of old men is the gray head. Um, you know what old people have, older people have, is they really have some wisdom. These people, these guys, they weren't trying to steal Rehoboam's kingdom. They were trying to help this young guy not do the dumbest thing of his life. I can remember, you know, the Bible says in Leviticus, some of those Old Testament laws are amazing. The Bible says, thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. I remember being a little boy. We started going to church and um, I was about six years old. And you know, you know how Baptist churches are. I don't know how other churches are, but Baptist churches, you know, you walk in the door and there'd be a guy standing at the door you know, and, and he'd shake your hand and sort of the greeter idea. You know, Walmart, that's, that's not new, you know. And uh, this was going on a long time ago. And you'd have these guys and they'd greet people and, and then they'd shake hands, you know, and the church service and all that. And um, we had just started going to church and dad hadn't been saved long. But dad grew up old school. And this guy came up and introduced himself and, and I said on my little hiney, you know, I was about this tall, and I smiled real big and shook his hand, you know, and acted a little bashful, and Dad said, uh, Dad told me two things. He said, and he drilled me on this one. He said, son, he said, when somebody talks to you, and they say, my name is, you look at them and say, 
He said, you look them right in their eyes. Don't look at the floor. He said, look right at them. And he said, if an adult comes up to shake your hand, he said, stand up and shake their hand and look them in their eyes. You know, for years, I just, I just thought that was the old school way. I came from the Bible. I shall rise up. You know what? You know what? It's, it's that thing of respect. It's that thing of respect. You read this book and you'll see examples and you'll see people that profited just. Let me give you another one. Real quick, 2 Chronicles 26, we're almost done. Uzziah was a great king. Um, Isaiah mourned when Uzziah died. All Israel mourned. He was a great king. But you'll notice something that happened with Uzziah. 2 Chronicles 26, verse 1, Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. He, be, he built Eloth and restored it to Judah. After that, the king slept with his father. 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign. Wow, that's young, isn't it? And he reigned 50 and two years in Jerusalem. That's a long time. That's one of the longest reigns of any king. His mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And man, you read the next 10 verses, and I mean God blessed him from every angle under the sun. God gave him cities and God caused the foreigners that had been at war with him to bring presents to him. And he built towers and digged wells and he had an unbelievable host of mighty men. And he was able to invent machines of war that had never been built. And his fame spread far and wide. Verse 15, and he made in Jerusalem engines Invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread far abroad for, look, boy, look at these words. He was marvelously helped till he was strong. And here's, here's what you see, verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. You know, he, 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 God blessed him and blessed him and blessed him and blessed him. And one day he just, he just, he just thought, you know what? God's going to bless everything I do, and it doesn't matter what I do. And, and you know what? I, I have arrived, and you know, I, 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 I can just, I'm the, I'm the cat's meow, and, uh, and it doesn't matter what I do. And what you see there, you see an example. What if God blesses you? You know, well, what if, what if tomorrow, you know, you get a letter in, in the mail, and, you know, your, your great uncle Henry that you never met and didn't know existed and he left you five billion dollars. That'd be nice. It'd be nice. But you know, a lot, of, a lot of Christians, you have to ask a question. Would that ruin you? Do you say, does it always ruin people? No, it doesn't. You know, you, you, you've got people, they, they go to all these extremes. You know, Abraham, God blessed him with great wealth. Job, he was the wealthiest man of the East. You know, there were some men that had it and still loved God and still did right. But you see an example, and the temptation is, if God blesses you, if God gives you all this stuff that you'd really like to have, you, know, you young guys, God gives you this beautiful wife, and then God gives you a, a beautiful house, and then God gives you a couple fancy cars, and then God gives you this job where you only have to work about 20 hours a week and you're rolling in the dough. What's that going to do to you? It doesn't have to ruin you. But you have an example of a man greatly used, greatly blessed, who in the days when he didn't have everything, he sought the Lord. But once he had everything, he forgot the Lord. You know, it's a good example to think about. Should the Lord decide to greatly bless you? If you thought on this example, it'd keep you out of trouble. 
I want to give you one more. Acts chapter 8. And like I said, there's, there's hundreds of these we could look at. When you read your Bible, look for the examples. God said, He said, these things were written for, for what? For our examples. Look at Acts 8. You've got, in Acts chapter 8, you've got the Ethiopian eunuch. And, um, you know, Philip joins himself to, his, to the chariot. And, uh, man, that, that eunuch, he's, he's, he's a, a big shot under the queen uh, of Ethiopia. He is her treasurer. And he's been in Jerusalem. You know why he's in Jerusalem? Because he's a Jewish proselyte. He had converted to Judaism. And he's, he's just been in Jerusalem. And he's reading the scroll of Isaiah. But he wants to understand it. And he's searching. And the Holy Ghost says to Philip, Philip, go to the desert. There's a man I'm going to take you to. And he gets to the desert. And man, he sees his chariot. And God says, jump in that chariot. And he gets in the chariot and the man is reading from the scroll of Isaiah and he's reading Isaiah 53, which is all about the, the death of Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, you guys know the story. They have that great conversation. Now, here's, here's what I want to point out. You know, in the, in the, at the end of the story, uh, the eunuch gets baptized. All right. And um, the eunuch says, man, you know, here, here is water. Phil, Philip's been preaching to him Jesus. And he says, you know, I, I, I want to get baptized. And, and Philip says, if thou believest with all thine heart. You know, the condition was, you know, baptism wasn't going to wash your sin away, but faith would. And he says, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So he says, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He said, I believe it. So he gets baptized. Now, here's what happens. You know, uh, you, some of you guys, you're going to run into some of these people. Some of you know some of them. And um, they, you know, that you talk about baptism and... Um, and they have some ideas about baptism, and they'll they'll um, they'll say, "Well, well, baptism makes you a member of a church, okay?" And um, and and then others will say, "Well, you know, you have to be baptized in a Baptist church, and if you if you if you don't get baptized in a Baptist church, it's not valid, and because you know, baptism must be administered by you know a, a, a ch the church and." And, and they've, they've got all these things attached to it. And I, that where I went to Bible school, we, we were taught all that. And um, I got reading this one day, and I saw something. Look at verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, and to the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And they found this, you know, he gets saved out there and they find a body of water. So there's three things that I want you to notice. Now, don't misunderstand me. I do believe that, that um, you know, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, they that gladly received his word were baptized and they were added into the church, 3,000 souls. You know, I, I get all that. I get all that. But um, if, if anybody else did what Philip did here, they would, have, they would have said to that Ethiopian eunuch, oh, that's not valid. You've got to be rebaptized, and, you know, and all that stuff. Um, so I, first of all, as you read this passage, I saw an example. I saw an example. First of all, there's no church here. Now, I would say there's, one, there's not one in a zillion miles. I don't know how far the, the nearest church was. But there is no church here. Secondly, church membership is not even remotely in view. He doesn't say, no, Mr. Eunuch, I'm going to baptize you, and you're going to become a member of the first church of the Gazan Desert. You know, <laughs> church membership is not in view here. All that's in view is obedience to the command of Jesus Christ. You know, the first command of our Lord after salvation, after salvation is to be baptized. He's just fulfilling God's order. And the third thing is this. There is no group of people present. It, this, used to, this stuff used to bother me in the sense that I would wrestle with it in my head because I thought, 
what about these people in these communist countries that get baptized secretly? And some of them, some of them, you know, there, there might be a, you know, a few believers present or whatever. I, I've, I've known them, you know, they'll go out in the woods and they'll, they'll gather around a lake or whatever. And, um, and, but you still got a bunch of people there. But I had a friend that was a missionary in China. And I had a couple of them in China. And they baptized people in the bathtub. Because that was the only way to do it. And you know, you're not going to get a church in your bathroom. You know, you, you might, you, there might be a couple of people standing there. But they would baptize them. And, and in, my, in my mind, I would try to reconcile all that. But you know what you see here? You see an example. They're in the desert. They're in the desert. Yes, I, I believe that, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a, you believe in the Lord, you know, we, we baptize people. It's a church thing. It, it really is. But, but you got to be careful about making these hard and fast rules where it's got to be your way or the highway and it's got to fit in this little box because this is not in the box. You know, uh, Brother, Brother Foff, most of you know Brother Foff up in Uranium City. He had an Olympic cyclist. Uranium City. You know, we're talking 400 miles north, 500 miles north here by aircraft. There's, you're out in the middle of nowhere. And um, there was 150 people in town, I think, at that time. And then the hospital closed. Now they're down to 50 or 70 people in town. And uh, 150 people in town. This Olympic cyclist comes from South Africa. He's there to visit a relative. It is... November, early November. And um, so Brother Foff gets to meet this guy. And he's going to be there for a week or two. And, and Brother Foff starts talking to him about the Lord. And he's really open to the things of God. And man, next thing you know, God is dealing with that young man. And, uh, and he gets saved. I mean, he turns to Christ, you know, calls out to the Lord. And, and uh, it's wonderful. And they're out there at the camp. And some of you, a lot of you guys have been to that camp. It's a beautiful place. And Brother Foff has a church building in the town, okay? And he's got, you know, a little handful of people that go there. But, but they're at the camp. And the guy says, not knowing a lick of Scripture, he gets saved and he goes, he looks out at the lake and he says, why can't I get baptized? You know what it sounds like? Here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Brother Foff goes, I guess we can do it. That water is cold in July. He called him his Ethiopian eunuch. A lot of the brethren would have a problem with that. Do you know why? They missed the obvious. They missed the obvious. So I hope what I've given you is just some things that will encourage you. And, and you know, if you have any questions, and, and God knows I don't have all the answers and I don't pretend to. But, um, but if you have got a question, I'll try to answer it. Uh, you know, about anything. I, and if I don't have an answer, I'll try to find one. But I just want to encourage you. You know what? This Bible is an amazing book. God has a ton of answers in there. And, um, and you can know your Bible. And God said, God said, Study to show thyself approved unto God. God says, I want you to read my book. But he says, he says I, I really want you, to, I want you to know it. Isn't that a blessing? God wants you to know it. He's the author. If you're saved, he's in you. You can talk to him. He's going to help you. And there's no better teacher than him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Bless your truth. Lord, let, us, let this be a blessing to your people, an encouragement to them. God, help, help us all in this room that we be Bible readers. And Lord, we would really, we'd love, Lord, just as you open your book up to us, Lord, that we would just, we just love it, Lord, and we would just take, take it in. God, that we would delight to read and study your book. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. God bless you guys.